You know, I kind of looked at when we started this process and having these conversations, there was three major areas that we had to really feel that we were confident in answering or finding the people to help us answer as we move forward. Um, one, I look at them as kind of in my brain as silos, but one of them is like, how are we sourcing the cattle? Where's the labor? And then how are we selling the meat on the other end? So labor was one that we spent a lot of time in the beginning having these conversations, right? Like. I don't think anybody really grows up saying, what I really want to do someday is cut meat, right? Um, but I think they haven't had those opportunities. And and it's been surprising as we've gone down this journey of, of people really starting to ask about it and to question it. So we have found um, the right experts to help us with our... Hey, hey, I'm Shay, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast the beef producer's place to explore new ideas and management practices to improve their lifestyle and operation. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you know that I am now open for speaking gigs. So if you want me to lead a workshop, be on a panel, or deliver a keynote at your next event, you can connect with me on my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and just use the contact box and I'll get back to you. So with that, let's dive right in to today's episode. Hey folks, I want to take a quick second to talk about a company that's doing some pretty cool things because we all know as cattle producers that funding and finances can be a little stressful, but Harvest Returns makes things simpler. Cattle ranching is hard work, but finding funding to start or grow your operation doesn't have to be. While traditional bank loans still have a place in finance, some ranchers have transitioned to an alternative form of funding through passive investors. Harvest Returns has raised over $12 million for multiple cattle ranchers across across the United States. Harvest Returns works with each ranch individually to help develop flexible terms that best suit the business's plan and cash flows. The company's pool of nearly 13,000 investors can help you expand your herd, fund improvements to your ranch, or help you scale to access new channels. Harvest Returns offers both debt or equity options and works within your existing operating model. To learn more about the capital raise process with Harvest Returns, visit harvestreturns.com slash ccc, and I'll put that link in the show notes. All right. Well, Troy and Stacy, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today because today we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what you're doing in the industry that's a little new and not necessarily related to the cow-calf side because you are starting North Prairie Butchery, correct? That is right. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And so r- tell the audience where you guys are located at today. Where is that located? Where are you guys located? Yeah, so we're located kind of north central part of South Dakota. Falkton is the name of our town. Um, we farm and ranch here just west of Falkton. And um, it's where I grew up and uh, on our home place here. And so um, so yeah, we've been in the cow calf uh backgrounding business, I guess, for, for a lot of years. Um, Stacy and I are both fifth generation in our family to be involved in in beef production and and uh as as the environment of the of the beef industry has continued to evolve, um, and we continue to look at how we could evolve our business. This here about oh a year and a half, two years ago, kind of came to us that we really needed to start investigating what it would take to to build a a, a beef processing facility of some of some sort we didn't quite know what mm-hmm. what we were necessarily looking mm-hmm. for but um started down that path and and uh it's kind of what got us to today is is building this facility here to to help with some of the harvesting issues that we've experienced over the last few years so you both come from ranching backgrounds correct Yes, we do. Yep. And we're raising the sixth generation. Uh, We have three children that are um, a part of the operation. Our son is now a sophomore at South Dakota State University, but our daughters were just out helping us yesterday, trying to get the barn ready for calving. (laughs) Well, awesome. So Stacy, are you from South Dakota too? Yep. I was raised on the Western part of the state. So I'm originally from the Sturgis area for those that think motorcycles and not cattle when they think of Mead County on that side of the state. But yeah, my family was a cow-calf producers backgrounding operation, similar to what we do now. 
Okay, so right now you you're on the when we think about the segments of the beef industry, you've got cow calf, you've got backgrounding, and you've got the meat side. Mm-hmm. So you're involved in about three different segments. Do you have anything else that you're kind of doing in between there too? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think at this point we're covering all the bases. Um, yeah. We've uh, yeah, you know we um, when I grew up. Um, we were primarily, you know, cow calf operation. And then we would background our calves. We've got a little backgrounding hard yard here and then typically sell those calves, you know, February timeframe, um, they'd be weighing, you know, 800, 900 pounds or something and, and get rid of them kind of in time for calving to start again. And that was kind of how we had, you know, done it for quite a few years or how my dad did it. And, when we took over, we wanted to look at expanding that and trying to capture more value. And so we started um, finishing our calves. Um, we would we worked with a couple different yards down in Kansas. Um, we would send them down there after we had backgrounded them and they would finish them for us. And so we were retaining ownership all the way um, as we'd market those calves on the grid um, through a couple different packers down there. And so um so that worked for pretty well and, and saw a lot of big gains in, in what we were trying to do. And then um, we'd always done a little bit of freezer beef here and um, had an opportunity to grow that with a, a restaurant partner uh, down in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And so, um, and that has really started to take off and do really well. And it's been a fantastic partnership with them. Um, we've worked with them now for, oh, about a year and a half or a little longer. And and um we've both kind of worked out the kinks and and feel like we're in a in a really good spot to uh to continue expand that and so that's one of the reasons that we've looked at trying to build a facility because um our issue is getting these cattle harvested we don't have a we don't have a little local locker plant um we've we drive quite a ways now to get to a, a couple of different inspected facilities and we're you know it's 150 to 250 mile round trips and we're taking you know, two to four at a time and uh, and then going back, getting that meat. And, and so, um, so that's kind of how it all came to be. Um, We've, you know, struggled with getting some cattle harvested down South, like we used to, and and everybody sort of experienced that if you finish cattle and, and, you know, whether it was COVID or, or packing plant issues that um, had to shut down for a time period. um, It's just become, it was getting really frustrating when you had good cattle and, and you do all these things and right at the end the last thing you need is to basically harvest all your hard work and and can't get it done and um and then right here locally essentially we in in our state we've got people that are saying boy we'd love to buy your beef um and so why are we shipping them (laughs) why are we shipping them 600 miles south um if we've got some markets here that we could tap into so so we're basically at this point, you know, trying to basically go from, I mean, really going from uh, pasture to plate at this point, um, calving them out here, um, finishing them all here and and serving them locally. Wow. That is awesome. So do you two want to talk a little bit about, you know, what that process looked like as far as starting North Prairie Butchery and talk about where you're at today with that process, but how did you get started? What did that process look like? Well, it came from finding the right people to help us, right? Like Trey said, we had kicked around this idea and we knew there was a need, but there was also this big void in, in who's the experts that can help us. So one of the things that we had found early on in our discovery process was a company called Protein Processors and Protein Processing Services. And what we have, they're kind of an umbrella group that has different companies under them to help with specific things. And and that started with helping us with our feasibility study, right? Like it's all got to start with the numbers and what can we do and 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 what are what does that look like? And I think when Troy and I first started this conversation, um, we didn't have a 25 head a day facility in mind, but it quickly showed us with the numbers that that's what it really needed to be. We certainly modeled other sizes, um, 50, 100, um, but when it came down to it, the 25 head a day really fit. Um, not only what we felt comfortable with, but also our community, you know, when you start to talk about labor and you start to talk about marketing that beef on the other end um, and sourcing the cattle, of course, 
it was a number that we felt very comfortable with and, and are excited about that size and, and opportunity with that size. So, so that's where you get started. And once we had that and our business plan put together, um, really the pieces have just continued to fall for us in, in that um, we've hit maybe little bumps in the road or had to stop and question things or make sure that we're on track. But when you have a really good model like that, it just, it just starts to fall together on how you accomplish it. So what were some of those bumps and challenges then? Oh, just really, you know, having this vision of what, what exactly we wanted to build, you know? So we, like Stacey said, we kind of got, you know, we got the feasibility study and wrote this business plan. And then, um, then it's like, okay, so how do you want to handle different things? You know, how would we, how would we handle cattle receiving? How are we going to distribute meat? How are we going to, you know, what, what services are we going to provide? Um, uh, what type of pro- um, packaging and labeling and, and are we going to do aging and smoking? And I mean, you name it, right. You oh. start to go down this long list. Of, right. How big does the cooler need to be? How yeah. big does the freezer need to be? How, um, I think it's, it's more of just those, um, like Trey said, processing through literally in our in our conversations with other experts and people of of what they need to do. You know, it, a project of this size takes financing and it takes a partners that have vision. It takes um, you know, keeping up with your your numbers on on, you know, it feels like a year ago when we really started to have this this process put in place. We're in a completely different world financially than we were a year ago. Right. And so those have been some of the challenges, but certainly not something that's held us back or or deterred us in any way. So did you go like, look at other facilities similar to that size and bigger, or what, what did that process look like so that you could see like what was going to work? Because the inside of whether it's a large packing plant or a small butchery, like they can be so vastly different and there are so many moving parts and pieces. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, we, don't, I don't think there's any tools. No, 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 there know? really so isn't. There's yeah. no, there's no magic stamp that you can put on and say, here's the, here's the perfect thing. Cause it really came down to what, you know, all the things we wanted to do inside of there mm-hmm. actually too. And, mm-hmm. and so, um, so yeah, we did, we were very fortunate. We got to go, um, we looked at a, a facility over in Wyoming. We looked at one down in Missouri, um, Stacy and I, through our experiences from uh, clear back at our days at South Dakota State University, have, have been into packing plants at different times over the years and seen some, you know, seen the big ones. And and um, so we've kind of had a feel for that, too. But I think that was the, you know, I, one of the things that we really liked about going and looking as we we saw a, a new brand new facility, um, heard, you know, heard some things that they wish they'd have done differently um talked to we saw a place that it was a remodeled building that they turned into a to a small locker plant and you know and what was the challenges there and what the wish they'd done different and so you know it's it's kind of like building anything whether it's a house or a a small packing plant um you know everybody after they build one wishes maybe they'd done a few different things (laughs) or done things a little bit differently and so you and we will too when we're all done Mm -hmm. i'm sure um but um, you know, we did learn a lot through that process and, and, uh, was really valuable. And sometimes it's just, maybe it's even more learning things, you know, here's what learning, what not to do, um, mm-hmm. probably helps as much to guide you as learning what you should do. Yeah. I think that's been really valuable is the opportunity to go see and and meet with people. Like for the most part, people have been like, so giving on, that open kind of door to say, well, I wish we would have done it like this, or this is what we're going to do different when we build on, or, you know, whatever the conversations were that we've had. And really our, our protein processing has really helped us too with that. They brought the experts through that have helped us answer those questions and navigated those questions when we had them at times um, to give us options or to think through things. And that to us has been really valuable. You know, it's, a, a processing facility of any kind is all about flow, right? And how do you get product to flow through there and people to flow through there? And um, we've really spent a lot of time on our building design and, um, you know, looking through that of how how the product would flow, how the people would flow. Those things are really key. So talk about the people flow. And you mentioned like the labor standpoint. 
before that, like, what are you doing to make sure that you have employees to keep product flowing through your facility when it's all done? You know, I kind of looked at when we started this process and having these conversations, there was three major areas that we had to really feel that we were confident in answering or finding the people to help us answer as we move forward. Um, One, I look at them as kind of in my brain as silos, but one of them is like, how are we sourcing the cattle? Where's the labor? And then how are we selling the meat on the other end? So labor was one that we spent a lot of time in the beginning having these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think anybody really grows up saying what I really want to do someday is cut meat. Right. Um, But I think they haven't had those opportunities and, and it's been surprising as we've gone down this journey of, of people really starting to ask about it and to question it. So we have found um, the right experts to help us with our South Dakota department of labor um, with working again with the protein processing company. Um, They, they have brought people to help us address that. We know though, we're going to have to be creative, right? Like in rural communities like ours, um, it's, it's going to take creativity to get it fully staffed. Um, and, but we're confident. I mean, we have people already in our small town stopping us on the street, asking us when we're hiring. I think they see it as a great opportunity that has, you know, set hours. We won't have weekend work. We won't have shift work. It will be, you know, during the day, normal hours. Um, we may, open early on, on different floors could do different flexibility. I mean, we're going to have to be flexible in how we approach the position, but we're going to have benefits and we're going to pay a higher wage, um, than other businesses in our community. And we're going to train people to have this job. We don't expect them to come with skills. Um, so there's, there's those opportunities. I feel, um, and our community has always been very progressive Uh, I think we can pull too from other surrounding areas um, because we will have good, good wages and and good benefits for jobs. Um, And then automation, we've tried to um, put as much automation into the plant as we can to really reduce that uh, some of the worst of the physical labor. So there's a lot of things you can do that um, maybe weren't as available in years past, but now you can put lifts on some of the equipment. So you're, you're known basically we're pushing carts, um, and you push a cart onto a lift and then that can dump, say, meat into a grinder or into the stuffer or some of those types of things. You're not having to, you know, pick up lugs of meat and, you know, lift them up over your head and dump them. And so, um, those are, you know, a lot of those, and it's just, it's kind of common sense thing, but it takes a little bit more money, but, um, that really widens your labor pool, right? You don't need to, don't need to be a weightlifter per se to come work for us. We can, we can take a lot of people with different skills and different abilities and, and find a home for them in our plant. So that's, uh, that was really important to us as well. Is there, are there any other automations that you're kind of excited to bring in or any other like specific aspects of what's going to be in the plant that you're really excited about? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a couple of things. One is um, maybe not automation, but just I would say this flexibility. So we would be able to, <clears throat> we're going to do as much custom work as we can, whether it's just, you know, a, an individual wants one freezer beef a year for their own personal use, or if you've got um, other ranches like ourselves that are doing some direct beef sales, and um, we want to do as much of that custom work as we can, because we know that needs been out there for a long, long time. And, mm-hmm. and we're going to provide, uh, we'll have the capability to do custom labeling. Um, obviously we can track all the carcasses and, and know where everything comes from and put your label on it, put it in your boxes if we need to, um, and then get that up back out the door to you. So, And then being able to do different things, um, like I talked about, we'd have the grinders so we can do that. But then portion cutting, um, roll stock packaging, Uh, we're going to have two smoke houses in the facility so we can do all of your sausages and and snack sticks and jerkies and those kind of things. Um, We can do wet aging or dry aging, either or. Um, And then, you know, we're going to have a retail outlet that goes with it as well. So so we're going to do, like I said, as much custom work as we can. And then at 25 head a day, that's, you know, we're going to buy some cattle as well to, to run through the chain. We're going to market that beef um, probably in a couple of different branded lines. And, and so um, having all of those pieces in there gives us a lot of flexibility to sort of adjust to whatever the market's telling us, um, whether it's, you know, seasonally or as, as we go through the cattle cycle, 
um, on a on a longer term basis, however that is, um, we think that's going to be some of the key to our success. Do you see that custom work as something? I mean, I know you're not quite into it yet, but do you see that being something that's going to be more challenging on the labor front or bring up other challenges compared to just being more straightforward with what you're offering? Or do you think it'll be more beneficial in the long run? No, I think we, I, you know, I, yeah, you, you know, when you get into the custom, you're going to have different cutting directions, right? Or instructions mm-hmm. that you're going to need to be following. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, how do we get that communicated to on the floor? Um, I think some of those ways that we can do that, though, is we're probably not going to, you know, it's not going to be a one custom beef comes through and then it's two that we bought for go here and then one more custom. And mm-hmm. you know, we'll probably have days that are just custom work and you just kind of got to know that every time you start cutting, you got to make sure you're looking at the right instructions. And then there's going to be days when we're um, just doing all, you know, they're all the same. And, and uh, you know, along with the beef, we're going to offer um, pork and bison as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's probably going to be the same type of deal. We're, we're probably not going to, um, might be, we'll do hogs one day a month or something like that. And that's all we'll do. So we're going to try to try to be a little bit smart on how we schedule things. So it's not, so haphazard about what's coming down the line. We just know to hit, you know, today's here's what we're going to do. And tomorrow's maybe going to be a little different. And, and I think too, that sort of, um, that sort of work is, is kind of fun too, because it's not just the same thing every day over and over again. I think too, like they've come a long ways in software that's available for that. And like one of the plants we toured um, on the TV screens in the fabrication floor is the cutting instructions, right? So it's it's not just this piece of paper that has to follow it through or, you know, like you're imagining some of our smaller, more custom type lockers yeah. haven't been able to invest in that kind of technology perhaps, and, or maybe didn't want to. Um, there, there is so much technology out now that helps with that information. And so it's, I think take some of that um, margin for error perhaps out because it will be so much more knowledgeable for the people that are on the floor. They can just look at the screen and be like, oh yeah, this is what we're doing. And this is, and that. And so I think there's that kind of information that can flow that helps your employees um, be successful because they'll have that knowledge. Awesome. So what are you going to do for like a rendering facilities? I know that can be a challenge for some of the smaller plants. So what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, that's always a, that's another big question that we get a lot. And it was one of the big ones we had early on as well. And so rendering is, is, is a challenge. There's really not uh, much rendering available to us. That's, that's economically close enough. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time talking about what's, what's the options there. And so we, we came down, come down to is that we're going to be um, installing an incinerator uh, on site to, to get rid of any of the off all that we're not using. Um, but I think that also one of those things that, um, keeps us on our toes too, because you know, everything you're dumping into that incinerator is, it's costing you money as well. Yeah. And so what can we do to avoid, um, dumping anything in there that we might find something else we can do with it? So, you know, we've talked about different options as far as, could we do something with some pet food lines, um, some custom, some custom grind for some of those types of things, um, because we got smoke houses, we could, you know, could we smoke in some bones for dogs or, you know, pets and those mm-hmm. kind of things. And um, we found an outlet for hides. So we're actually going to have a hide room in the plant. Um, but yeah, then, you you know, so we're, we're going to try and be creative. And, and as we go through, continue to look at what can we can we keep out of the incinerator as much as possible. Um, but we'll know we'll have that right there. And um, I think that'll be better. I, I guess the best option we have at this point. Are there any other like businesses in your area that would also find use out of that incinerator where it would be like split costs or anything like that? Yeah, or is well, it just we've talked be about that. <laughs> yeah. We give our, uh, we give our, our veterinarian, who's also our friend and our neighbor, we give her a hard time about, you know, we can get rid of her mistakes that way. So, we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, yes. that's just it. You know, we've, uh, where we're building the plant, they've got a, a brand new hardware store there. And, you know, obviously they have some cardboard waste and some of those things. Mm-hmm. And we've got, um, you know, just because of our location, you know, recycling, it really isn't an option. And 
Um, and uh, we know we got to have a certain amount of dry matter that goes into the incinerator. So you got things like that or scrap pallets or, um, you know, <laughs> the, you start to think about those kind of things. And so, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a money maker per se, or, but uh, yeah, it, it might be kind of interesting if you have, you know, it's like a lot of things, maybe wouldn't have thought about that before, but all of a sudden you have this, this thing in your community and sort of lets you start to think about, well, what's the better ways to utilize some of that stuff. Going back to the community again, around how many employees are you anticipating needing once you're up and running? Uh, we'll need about 25 people on the okay on the floors. Yep. Working. Um, and, and we have been, our community has been very supportive of this. Um, probably for the last, I don't know, COVID always throws things off, but the last three to five years, um, the economic development has a community meeting here in our community and, and the, the need of a processing plant has come up in the top five, all of those years. So our community has been very open to it. They've actually tried to recruit people um, to come in and open a processing plant over the years, and it just wasn't, hasn't been successful. So we're very excited that we have that support. That's often one of the questions we get pretty early on too is, well, how does your community feel about this? And um, so we're very fortunate in that way that, as I've said before, we have a pretty progressive community and they have been supportive in every way. Hey folks, I want to take a brief break to talk about one of my favorite calving books. And you know, if you're tired of the hassle of managing your cattle records, I want to introduce you to Cattle ID because it will do the work for you. The Cattle ID platform makes it easy to store, share, and collaborate on all your herd information from your mobile device. It saves you a lot of time and effort. Plus, you get access to actionable analytics that can help you and your team make better decisions for your ranch. Don't just take my word for it. Try Cattle ID and feel the magic of hassle-free ranch management for yourself. Seriously, sign up now and see the difference it can make for you and your team. There's a link in the show notes. So what do you want beef producers to know as they kind of hear your story and hear that this is becoming an opportunity because it's going to serve more your local area, but let's, so let's break it down and let's start with like local beef producers. What do you want them to know about what you're going to be providing for the community and the resource that you're building? Well, I think um, it, we've had a, a lot of conversations with producers um, since the word has been getting out that we're building the butchery and I, I refer to it as dreaming because a lot of them haven't been able to really think about expanding their direct sales business or even their freezer beef kind of sales because they can't get them processed, right? And for us to start to have these conversations with them to say, we could do more and how, how do you start to ramp up on your end to be prepared and be ready and think about all the things that you need to think about? Um, you can really hear people start to, to have serious plans that they're putting together and, you know, new business outlet streams for them and, and how our business can help them reach that, right? Like Trey said, by putting on custom labels and being able to put it in boxes that they want, or, you know, just those opportunities. And I think that's, what's been huge. And, and these aren't just probably, I'd say in our local area, we're, we're having conversations from hundreds of miles away because people can bring a whole trailer load or a semi load. We'll be able to take um, a semi load and house them overnight. The ones that we're not able to process during one day, we'll be able to process them the next. So those start to change the game when you can have those conversations with producers about what it means to their business and their enterprise and could they bring a child home because they can add this new enterprise or can they, yeah. you know, develop something different than, than even they've been allowed to think about because we just don't have this in our state and, and it could allow that. So you talked about finding the right people earlier, but you know, how did you make sure you were finding all the right relationships because you're looking at the rural economic side, you're looking at the design side, there's got to be environmental regulations, you know, you're looking at USDA inspection, like I, and you know, way more all the hoops and regulations and everything you've <laughs> jumped through than I do. I'm just, you know, going off of what I've heard other people say. 
So how did you make sure that you found all the right people and connections to get those squared away easier? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I think Stacy and I were in a unique position to kind of tackle this project just because of some of the experience we we have had in the past and the the network of folks that we do know. Um, I think that's all played into that. And so, um, so, you know, we, we, I would say we knew more than enough to be dangerous on, to get started on this. Um, but I mean, we, we did, we had a pretty good working knowledge of, you know, the basics of what this would take. Um, and then you got to find the details. And so, um, you know, as we were looking around and trying to find the right folks um, to help us, you know, some, essentially you start making phone calls, right? And you ask people and if, if they don't, maybe they can't help you, but maybe they know somebody who can. Um, and you continue to go down those paths. And you, and you know, it's it's like a lot of things in life. You can tell pretty fast if, you know, the folks you're talking to kind of know what they're doing or, you know, can graft your vision of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was, uh, you know, that was kind of how it played out here. So I think the, the, the key with this is that it's... Um, you know, it doesn't happen fast. Like I said, we've been working on this for over a year and a half at this point. Um, and it, and it does, it takes a lot of time. It really does because, you know, there's a reason that these haven't been built. Um, you know, any of them in recent times are they, because it is, it's a big undertaking. It's, they're very expensive. Um, there are a lot of hoops to jump through. You got to figure out everything from where you're going to get the cattle to where the wastewater is going to run out of your plant. Um, and how do you handle everything in between? And, you know, like Stacey said, just from even the time we started on this project to now, the, the economic uh, conditions that you're dealing with, I mean, interest rates have, as we all know, have doubled or tripled and, and um, <clears throat> the cattle cycles feels like it's in a completely different spot than it was a year and a half ago. And, and so those are all, all the things that continue to add up in there. But um I think one thing that this has done is it showed us how important it was to have this flexibility in the system. Um, you know, when we first got our feasibility study back, that would have, that suggested don't do any custom work, right? The money is in mm -hmm. buying cattle and selling beef because cattle were pretty, you know, mediocre priced and beef was high. And, and today it's almost flopped. I mean, cattle have come up, fat cattle have come up in price, beef commodity, beef prices have been, a little stagnant and um now it says geez you should do more custom work um so that's we've learned as we've gone through you know even though we haven't uh you know tipped over a shovel full of dirt even on the project yet we've actually learned a lot about the process and the business side just from continuing to watch our model and continuing to put new data into it and see what it tells us to do and and i think that right there tells us we started with the right people because we do have such a such a good model to continue to work with. And so it's, it's gone good though. I mean, but there's been times, there was time last summer, we really had to sort of pump the brakes. There was a, a part of it that we were trying to figure out that was taking more time. And, and some of the first thoughts we had or advice we were given on how to handle it, we honestly weren't comfortable with it. And, and so we, we kind of pumped the brakes and we made some more phone calls and found some more people to talk to and through our network, you know, and friends of friends type mm -hmm. thing. And, and we're able to put together an answer that we did that we were comfortable with. And that's, you know, that's, you don't, you don't want to make a, you know, stub your toe too early in this process. So it's, it's okay to, as frustrating it is, is that it takes this amount of time. It's okay to slow down and make sure you're doing it right. Just, <clears throat> excuse me. Good starts are worth it. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I think I've been so grateful at how generous people are, right? So people don't see us as competition or they don't, I mean, they just want to share their knowledge and their information and um, help you navigate things. I, I really do think that all most people are good people that want that, right? Um, and we've just been really fortunate, like Trey said, with our network to find those people really quickly to get those answers and help us navigate when we run into these little snags. So where is this beef going after it leaves the plant? Like you said that some people are doing customs, right? So maybe if they're doing direct to consumer, like, you know, obviously they're in charge of part of that, but where else is it going? Like, is it going to go into local grocery stores? I know you mentioned like restaurants earlier, like where's this beef going to end up? 
Yeah, that's a that's a thing that we'll continue to work on. So, you know, the, the what we're working off of right now is our own personal experience of marketing our own beef. And that's a, a pretty small sample size compared to the, you know, this this project we're talking about. It's going to be over 6,000 head a year. So, so all of those have to grow together. Um, kind of when T Stacy was talking about the the silos that are all connected, <laughs> but the the you know we got to have enough labor, we and we got to have enough cattle, and we got to have markets, and so we can't we can't harvest more cattle if we don't have enough labor. Um, we don't need more labor unless we got cattle lined up, and none of that matters if we don't have a market for that beef, right? So all of those sort of have to all rise together. Um, you know, we planted a lot of seeds out there, you know, we can't go to anybody today and price it and, you know, say when we're going to have it. It's a lot of theoretical conversations, obviously, but, um, we've turned down a lot of restaurant business in the last year. Um, you know, and so just getting back with those folks and continuing to update them on, um, how we're getting along, um, with our construction and where we're at in the process, um, but yeah, we've really got, um, you know, we've got a lot of options. It can go into grocery stores. Um, uh, we can, you know, we'd love to get into more restaurants, continue to grow that business. Um, we're going to have a retail store right attached to the butchery um, where people would come and buy it directly from us. And so, um, you know, I would say the answer is a little bit all the above. Um, we'd love to to get it into wherever people appreciate it and, and uh, would like to have that locally raised South Dakota beef. We start, like Troy said, starting to build those relationships because the the business side that we'll be on is going to be, you know, about relationships. We not be might not be the cheapest price product that they can source out there for beef and pork and bison. But one of the advantages we'll have is the story behind it and that connection that we know that people are craving and want to do. So so we've started that and we know that those relationships then will turn into those opportunities to sell meat to them. And, and that's one of the things that we can be doing right now and have been working on pretty heavily. So what have each of your roles been in this project? Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you split that up? Cause you're probably not doing the same things. So what are each of your roles been? Well, it, you know, <laughs> up to this point, it's a, it's a huge team effort. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say there's anything we've been able to split off and say, well, you go figure this out and right. I'm going to go figure this out. I mean, I, this takes, takes a lot of teamwork and looking at a lot of things from a lot of different angles. And so it takes a lot of that bouncing, bouncing off and um, figuring that out. So I don't know that we've had any real split roles too much at this point. Um, no, I think, I think we, yeah, the motivation to keep each other, cause you know, this is a, this is a intensive, like Troy said, project. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of things. Um, so we just, I think probably have helped keep both each other accountable. Um, both keep us motivated, you know, when one's like, oh, I don't know. And the other one will be like, oh yeah, yeah, this is how we're going to navigate this and get it done. And so, I mean, one thing Troy and I have always been is a real powerful team in tackling things like this. And um, so it probably fills our drive, like, like we were probably wired to do something like this, <laughs> thinking back. I mean, we just really work well together and process. Uh, we each see things differently, but really connect on that level. And um, we laugh, we, we received a um, MPEP grant, a meat poultry. I never remember how to, what the acronym is. A USDA grant. Yeah. yeah. Called meat and poultry processing expansion program grant. Yeah. The MPEP grant. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm fairly good at writing grants and um, Troy has decided he will never like to write another federal <laughs> grant again. So we, we found his limit there. Yeah. He thought of writing a, I think our grant proposal when it went in was how many pages? 441 pages long. Yeah. So. You said 441? 441 pages long goodness yeah. gracious <laughs> yeah so it, it's it's a it's a journey um a fed, writing a federal grant is what i call a journey but yeah he's has decided that's not his favorite part um but it did pay off for us we um were rewarded uh 2.2 million to help us with the project and that's been a huge boost obviously um just to know that you're a a group of your peers that have reviewed that grant feel that your proposal is well put together too and um, and then obviously the financial part of it has been huge too, but there's, I think there's just those things that we brought to the table, um, mm -hmm. that we each have and, and just our network, I think has been 
huge that we both called on and see, you know, utilize our network in different ways. Yeah. And then time I mean, mm. it takes a lot yes. of time to work on this, you know, yes. so because we are involved in all the other segments of, you know, raising cattle with those, obviously that has to come first. And so you got to find, find time, you know, whether you're making phone calls while you're in the payload or feeding or, <laughs> you know, a lot of working on it in the evenings, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's probably where the big split is, you know, who's got time today to work on this and trying to figure out how to, how to handle the workload too. So it's, you know, up to this point, it's taken time and money. Um, okay. That's to all. Get, to get this far. <laughs> yeah. Um, nothing so, major. <laughs> nothing major. No. Yeah. So, as we kind of wrap up today, looking at the big picture, like in the next five to ten years, when you look at the beef industry, what do you think is the biggest change we're going to see as beef producers? Well, I think our hope is through this is just that we've we've got a little more redundancy in the system. I mean, COVID showed us that we've we got some pretty narrow bottlenecks um it's a big industry we raise cattle everywhere in this country and and yet at the very end that funnel gets pretty darn tight and um and when you have one little blip in the issue whether it's covid or a, a plant goes down for whatever reason um i mean it it sends shock waves through the system and it takes us months to dig out um and so I think that's one of the lessons we've learned was that, um, you know, we just need more redundancy in the system and, and we got to spread our, our risk out a little bit more mm -hmm. um, through this whole process. And so, um, you know, I, you know, obviously uh, there's a lot of issues in the industry and you can, you can sit here all day and talk about those and, and uh, a little 25 head per day plant in Falkton, South Dakota, isn't going to solve all of those. Um but for us, it was like, you know, what's, you know, what, what's a step that we can take? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not too many people are, are set up to go build a new 6,000 head per day plant. And in my opinion, we don't need another one of those because um, you're right back to where you've got a handful of these. And when a 6,000 head a day plant has a trouble, um, it shut down. When a 25 head a day plant has trouble, it shut down too. But we don't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't cause so many issues. And so, so I think as we look forward, um, to me, it's it's more about what do we do to get more of these types of facilities into more rural communities. Um, you know, you can there's a lot of places in cattle country you could build a 25 head per day facility and have enough water, have enough labor um, to to do this. There's not many places you can build these giant plants, and so um, what about spreading these out a little bit more and getting a little bit closer to the cattle and and hopefully in five or 10 years, we can say, hey, yeah, that was that wasn't a bad plan to have a few of these around. So. Yeah, I think what they could do to boost some rural communities. And when I look at, you know, the opportunities in five to 10 years that we could see in our rural communities to say, could that next generation come home and offset? you know, working in the plant, maybe, like I said, where it's going to take creativity and then they still be able to be home helping on the place part-time, you know, cause there's always enough labor to go around in, especially in the cow calf segment, but not always enough cash flow to support a full, you know, full-time families. Um, and can a plant, can our plant help give that dream to, to families to have that flexibility and that opportunity and, and it's a win-win. So, I, I, I agree with Troy. There are so many challenges that we could talk about in the industry side. Um, I more like to look at it and say, what, what can we create with opportunities to address those challenges? And that's where we feel the butchery really is able to do that in our little corner of the world. Well, awesome. Thank you very much to both of you for being on my podcast and visiting with me today. I really enjoyed your story and where can cattle producers go to learn more about what you're doing? Is there a website? Is there social media? Where do you want people to go to? Yeah, you bet. All the above. NorthPrairieButchery.com. Um, you can check it out there. and um, You can find us on Facebook and Twitter as well um, at that same deal. But, you know, as you're looking at this and you're thinking about it, you know, what I tell people is, too, is if, um, you know, Stacy and I aren't going to be able to do all of this on our own. We can't just, um, you know, magically two of us make this happen. So, so we need a lot of support from other producers. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so if, 
as you're looking at our information and thinking about it and you're and thinking about what could a 25 head per day beef, pork, and bison processing facility mean to you, um, or if you've ever said, boy, I wish we had something in our mm -hmm. area, or I wish we had something in our region um, like this, then we really encourage people to, to get on there and, and find our contact information on there and just give us a call. Um, Cause we're going to need, you know, we're going to need support to make this happen. And um, that's what we're really encouraging people to do today. So yeah, check us out at NorthPrairieButchery.com. Well, awesome. Thank you very much again. All right. Thank thanks. You. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.